everyone, and welcome to a very special 1973 podcast interview with, I'd like to say, friend, maybe, future friend, friend of the show, Bruce Patterson, former intern for the Hockey News. Very happy to have another hockey personality on. Uh, there's some people on the podcast that don't like the hockey, but <laughs> they also love the baseball, so we had a... We had a quick conversation about that. And uh, yeah, it's Bruce. Great to have you. Um, Want to talk uh, about all kinds of different things here. Kind of a friend of Ed's brother. Uh, and uh, very happy when uh, he reached out to us that uh, somebody wanted to come on and maybe share some stories and talk about the sports world and maybe talk a little wrestling. We love the wrestling on this show. We love it. Uh -huh. Absolutely love it. One hundred percent. Yeah. Uh, so I'll let you uh, introduce yourself and have the floor. Yeah, great. Oh, well, thanks a lot, Andy. And hey, Ed, how's it going? <laughs> Good to see you, Bruce. Nice yeah. to meet you, actually. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> uh, actually, I'll lead off with this first. I know I said I was going to do something differently, but uh, just a fun fact. I used to be the ring monkey for the NWA New England. So... Um, when Jason Rumble had his crew over in Malden, uh, I helped set up the ring there. Oh, we have, uh, let me add something. We have a, a recurring guest on the show, Knuckles Nelson. I don't know if you know him at all. Uh, maybe after my time. Okay. All right. Just trying to draw a, you know, six <laughs> yeah, points so of separation there with, uh, with this wrestling story, but go ahead. Uh, no, in fact, uh, it was one of those things where, uh, I was really hoping that this would be something that would carry on for a little while because, you know, indies are really where a lot of the real diehard wrestling fans are, you know, they come to, to watch. I mean, it was fun because we set up all over the place, whether it was over in Melrose, over in Revere, you know, places like that. And, um, you know, I got to say, there's probably about 20 to 30 people during those those matches, you know. But I got to tell you, the people that really are fun to watch are the old timers because ah uh, you don't give them anything to throw period <laughs> nothing to throw because they will join the fight in the ring <laughs> but you know other than that you know that was um that was one of the uh of the fun facts that i had in fact the very last match that we did was actually over at the good time emporium over in somerville oh no uh, kidding yeah that that shows you how far back that went and it was funny because We'd no sooner wrapped up the match there that they were showing a UFC match over in one of the other ballrooms. And, you know, as we were just breaking down the, the ring and everything, I go out there and there are five fights out there in the parking lot. It's like, what's happening here? <laughs> oh, but yeah. Now, anyway. do you have a favorite wrestling story from the time that you were uh, involved? No, because the funny thing about it is that uh, despite the, oh, start that again. Despite the fact that, you know, this is something that I really loved, everybody in that room totally was uh, in love with the sport too, because the thing is, is that they were all very dedicated. They were normal as you and I, no, no doubt about it, you know? And I think it was also an important time because that was, you know, back in the late eighties and things were really starting to ramp up. I mean, the WWF at the time owned the world, they owned the world, you know? And, um, you know, I think one of the greatest books that I read was actually Mick Foley's have a nice day, you know, because, uh, he goes into it. And one of the best stories in there, because one of the tired tropes that any wrestling fan hears all the time, it's fake you know, get over it. It's entertainment, you know, yeah, maybe the uh, outcomes are determined, but when the day is done, they're still jumping off the third rope onto that canvas and having set up a ring myself, there is no cushion there. You know, you've got like maybe one, one and a half inches of foam. That is all you got, you know, and um, you know, the springs there, you know, again, if you felt just two feet, that alone is going to knock the wind out of you. Never mind six, you know, or in the cage match, 35. But, uh, <laughs> you know, that I had, is. Uh, I had the um, pleasure of the NWA, uh, the Crockett promotion, that that's what everybody knows it as now. But 
I was mm-hmm. a big uh, NWA guy growing up in the 80s. Uh, I was nice. always foo-foo with the WWF because I always <laughs> liked that. The NWA brought a little bit more of a sports-based presentation to it that uh, it, it looked more like a actual conflict between, you know, good and good and bad, not so much cartoony. I know when Hulkamania first started, it wasn't that bad yet. The rock and wrestling thing wasn't that bad. But by the time the Ultimate Warrior got there, they started more with gimmicks and it turned great wrestlers into gimmicky wrestlers, kind of like, you know, Rick Martel became the model. And you know mm-hmm. what I mean with that. They kind of took away from what the guys brought to the table. It wasn't Kerry Von Erich. It was Texas Tornado. But where where I was going with it is uh, two years in a row, uh, the NWA came to the Boston Garden. And I remember it because it's always around my birthday in April. I believe it was 87 and 88. And I remember going both times and saying, wow, this is this is amazing to see live. Um, I, I couldn't believe that they broke WWE F territory at the time, you know, coming up to the Northeast. And it was packed. I mean, it was all <laughs> deep-minded individuals. There wasn't so many people there that were expecting to see something and got something else. They knew what they were coming for. Um, so yeah, uh, wrestling tradition and history of of wrestling, I'm I'm big on. And we talk about it on the podcast all the time. How much it's changed and how overblown it's become. Where it's not. I miss. I, I like to give this analogy. When you're walking down the street, you'll cross to the other side of the street because you see somebody that kind of gives off that red flag that, hey, this guy's something something different. I don't want to see guys that look like they're washing your windows at the gas station in, in the rink. I want to mm-hmm. see the Bruiser Brodies, the Abdullahs, the, the unpredictable characters or the larger-than-life Hulk Hogan's and the guys that can't work a 9-to-5 job. Dick Murdoch was not working a 9-to-5 job. You know, it's just it's just a different breed of guys, and I don't think it's for the better. I think the storylines need to go back to good versus evil, not in a hokey way, but they've they've gotten away from that. And it's the high spots doesn't make a match. Drawing you in and wanting to see the conclusion for the ride is what makes wrestling wrestling and falling in love with the story almost like you know going to the movies when you don't realize you're in a good movie when you're there for two hours because it's so good and that's what that's what the love of wrestling and is in the psychology too you know the, mm-hmm. the i'm gonna chase. feedback on what andy said on that yeah. is is that like I, bruce I, I don't know how you feel about it but you know i i really can't it's very hard for me to get into the into the new stuff now because of what andy said like there's like the there's a lot of times there's no reason for the match there's no there's no reason for the blow off. It's like, it's, you know, I mean, and the thing about it is just when Andy and I first met in the seventh grade, it was like, I was, you know, I was a big WWF fan. And all of a sudden he's like, Hey, do you ever watch TBS? I was like, yeah, they got that wrestling at six Oh five. And all of a sudden he and I started really watching it. And like, like he and I would talk about it constantly. And it was, you know, it, to piggyback on the other thing he said was, it was that sports kind of like entertainment and really kind of have like that more real feel to it. And now it's like the, the storytelling, it's, it, it doesn't have a story to, to have a story. Mm-hmm. And it's just like, yeah, we're going to throw these guys together. And like a lot of the stories, it's just kind of hokey. And it's just like, yeah, this isn't, it's, it, it's bad. And then when they cut the promos, like the promo, like the vignettes go way too long. And it's, and it's just like, it, it's like they think that more is better and it's and the thing is just like the the you know the three of us grew up are pretty much close to the same age less was always more mm-hmm. you know like because you only had so many programs we didn't have internet and so like it was like when they cut a 30 second promo you're like that was awesome i want more and you mm-hmm. went looking for finding it and now there's just so much and it's and it's just like in the and they go on and on and it's like okay this could have been cut down into 30 seconds not two minutes well to andy's point he used the perfect word for that character because yes. those wrestlers did have character uh i remember as a kid uh, we had um i grew up in new hampshire so we had wmur in manchester 
and they would have an independent wrestling circuit there. And it was phenomenal because I remember the first match was the Wolfman and some poor schlub. And I just remember at one point when it was getting really gnarly, they would put like uh, this horrible Band-Aid graphic over the TV. <laughs> yes. <laughs> The big hats. <laughs> oh, it was phenomenal, you know, and you bought the story hook, line and sinker, you know, um, and then when they ultimately came over to my town, hometown of Dover, New Hampshire, we had a, um, a former supermarket that had gone out of business and they turned that into one of the wrestling stops. And the first wrestler I ever met was Haystacks Calhoun. And that man was so big. They actually had to open up both doors just to let him go in sideways. So, <laughs> yeah, you're, you're dating yourself on that one, Bruce. I, I uh, always <laughs> live, love to tell the um, the story about my love of wrestling started. In, all my memories are like around 1977. You know, like four or five years old. The Star Wars boom, uh, seeing it in the theater. Um, around that time was when Billy Graham had beaten Bruno for the belt. Now I didn't, I don't remember him beating him for the belt, but I do remember him having the belt. And mm -hmm. uh, he was the guy that drew me into loving pro wrestling. Uh, that, that year, that run that he had with the title, I can remember watching that on channel 56 around here and channel six had it and uh, just loving and being drawn to him. And I don't even re really remember him as, as a kid being a heel, I just remember him being larger than life and talking into the camera and how big he was. And the grand wizard was always there <laughs> buzzing around and he would always, you know, come in with some little Weasley thing at the end to kind of like keep him heel um, and loving, loving Billy Graham. And then, you know, buying the wrestling magazines and going ah, to yeah. the small WWF, spot shows when they would have them around here and then we started going to the garden and then we started going to providence civic center and it, it was it was inexpensive to be a wrestling fan back then um, oh yes very yes. inexpensive i mean you could get you could bring if there was four people in your family you could go for under 20 bucks mm -hmm. and uh yeah. you know the programs you wanted the program because there was new one every month and you wanted the card the little lineup that they had inside the card and the, the merchandise was very minimal too. Buttons, no t-shirts, mm -hmm. uh, you know, eight by tens, and they were all black and white. And you would hope that you could run into somebody eventually and get them to sign it. Um, but yeah, it was it was very low-key and smoke-filled buildings. You could, you know, <laughs> I remember people smoking in the, the and you would see it in the lights and all that stuff. And uh I I actually missed that. And seeing how big those guys were when you're, you know, five, six years old and you're looking at them going, holy crap, this guy's huge. Because you, all you have is people that you can relate to that are your parents or friends or whatever. And these guys were like monsters. And that's that's what I miss about it is, is that part of it. Um, well, and let, let's be honest about this. I am sure at some point in your life, you and your group of friends enacted most of those scenes live in never, the playground. Never, never, never. <laughs> I, I, in, in the days where you couldn't get merchandise, I remember making cardboard wrestling titles and go, going in my inside wrestling and trying to find a good picture of, you know, the NWA world title and like trying to get it exact, like with a, with a magic marker on a piece of cardboard that you cut out and taking duct tape and making the, the strap for it. And oh yeah. I, I would all in uh, definitely uh, more of a historian now looking back on where guys were at what time and what territories they were in. And, you know, these, these little blurts of they did the same angle with chief J strongbow and Greg Valentine that they did with Wahoo and chief J and uh, Greg Valentine in the Carolinas. Cause nobody knew that those TVs would ever cross and, you know, less Plus was more back then, and those guys were were something special. Hey Bruce, you know that's funny. You you talk about that, but there was one time if I and I I could be uh, misremembering the story a little bit, but I didn't have the I didn't have the dirty blonde, the, the dark brown hair <laughs> like I have now. I had the Ric Flair hair like this back in the day, 
And I do remember going home basically with red hair because I was hanging out at a certain particular person's house and the <laughs> fake blood went in my hair. <laughs> well, you had to buy all the fake blood you could at Halloween because you couldn't order That's it right. any other time during the year. So you had to stock up in case you were having a, a backyard match and you wanted to slap some on. Yeah, I, mean, so I, I could be misremembering this story, but I'm pretty sure that that happened. Because it wasn't until yeah. uh, 2020 came out with John Stossel where they showed Eddie Mansfield on how to do the blade job. That, that's, you know, we never knew. We never knew. Well, you know, again, it's one of those things when you see some of the wrestlers from those early days. Holy cow, their foreheads are like a roadmap. I mean, there's just so much scar tissue there, you know. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, you know, it's funny. I don't know if you guys ever saw it, but... Um, I say probably, oh geez, maybe uh, probably early '90s. Freddie Blassie and Andy Kaufman uh, did a movie together, um, uh, Breakfast with Blassie. And uh, so, what was going on was Blassie was going around to the Museum of Fine Arts. Well, actually, no, I'm sorry, this was at the Boston Public Library, and he was doing these promotional tours, and he was talking about the movie, but he was also telling wrestling stories. I could sit and listen to that guy all day. Um, I'll leave you with the one that was the one that stayed with me most of all. They were uh, wrestling over at the LA Coliseum. And well, Haystacks, they know that the traveling aspect for him is not the greatest. You've heard the airplane rides where he's had to use a mailbag to go to the bathroom because he's not going to fit in the stall there. Well, at the LA Coliseum, he drove, he had driven his van there. And so as the wrestlers were walking by the van, they noticed that he had brought his chihuahua with him. And so the chihuahua had taken a dump in the passenger side. So one of them had the idea to go over to the passenger side and the dog would jump from the drivers into the pile and then onto the windows. And they get him to do that back and forth until there was just nothing but crap smeared all over the windows. <laughs> I mean, if, if if you're into the dark side of the rings, uh, there's there's been a bunch of them. Uh, I think there's five seasons now, six seasons, and they've they've touched on a lot of stuff that the pure wrestling fans know. That it's nice for the people that you know are are newer fans and they're trying to get acclimated with with the older stories and things like that. But every once in a while, they'll do a story on somebody like Chris Colt and. Uh, it's kind of like you watch this stuff and these guys cannot function. Like I said, like a nine to five job. You, that's a perfect example. Terry Funk is not bagging groceries at Shaw's. You know what I mean? Guys Even at this at, age. No, no, but I, I'm just saying those guys weren't, they're not geared for that. They were geared to be, you know, either in pro sports or after pro sports into, you know, the, the, Wahoo McDaniels and the Ernie Ladd's perfect transition to wrestling because they were actually making more money back then than playing pro football. And a yeah. lot of them would play in the off season to supplement their income, you know, back and back and forth. And then they, then they had a name. You know, it's funny you brought up dark side of the ring because I just rewatched that heartbreaking two part series with Chris Benoit. That was such a tragic loss. And um, even more disturbing was I saw the documentary on China and there were a lot of parasites in wrestling. There's a lot, you know, and the, this is actually in the transition to the new because she's actually I would consider more the new generation where it was all about product placement. And, you know, this was at the point where, you know, the WWF turned into WWE and that was sports entertainment at that point. Because there was that story between Ted Turner and Vince McMahon. They were both um, in trying to outdo one another. And so one day, uh, Ted Turner bought the WCW uh, and calls up Vince and says, you know, Vince, guess what I did? And he goes, I don't know what. He goes, I I bought uh, WCW. Now I'm in the wrestling business. He goes, well, good for you. I'm in the sports entertainment business and hung up on it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, there's uh, a brand new Vince McMahon documentary uh, coming on Netflix that I'm hoping that everybody on the podcast will watch and we can do a deep dive into that because uh, 
I know Ed hasn't seen it yet, but I was very disappointed with the Iron Claw movie uh, about the Von Eric brothers. It was, huh. they took a lot of liberties with it and it was an, um, I don't think they really did it any, any justice with the whole family. And, and Oh, it could have been much darker. It should have been actually much darker because yeah. those were the realities because outside of the father being pretty much a rat bastard. I mean, this, this was real. You're, you're correct. It was really glossed over. Yeah. Um, yeah. It, and I was actually, I was hoping for a lot more on that, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, um, I thought they could have done a little bit better with the casting too. Uh, I yeah. think uh, that, um, I forget the guy's name from the band that played uh, oh, Terry Jeremy Allen White. Yeah, uh, too small. He was very short compared to like Kerry. Um, so yeah, it would they kind of dropped the ball with me with that. But that's that's I could go on forever, but we're here to talk about you. So let's uh, let's transition away from the uh, the wrestling. We'll start talking about uh, your life with uh, hockey. The hockey news. Yeah. 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 Well, it was funny because I had, I had moved to Boston from New Hampshire because I wanted to be a sportscaster. And so anyway, when I had actually an interview over at WBZ because I totally wanted to do that over there. And that was at the time Bob Lobel was pretty much at his peak power too. And I had my interview with him. And the sad part about it is I wasn't going to college. In fact, I'll let you, I will warn you guys ahead of time. I'm armed with a GED. So just beware. Um, so <laughs> <laughs> the problem here is that you can't work at any of the television stations here uh, unless you're absolutely hired as actual talent. That wasn't happening with me. Um, the other way in was as intern. Uh, however, as an intern, you had to be at least a junior in one of the colleges here. So that was out for me too. So ultimately I ended up with some roommates uh, over in Alston and um, you know, they let's just say their, their economic uh, uh, band was a lot higher than mine. Uh, these are, these are rich kids. Very nice. Very nice. And one of them actually moved up from New York and he was working with Stan Fischler. Uh, I can use his name, Gil, Gil Aarons. He was, uh, he's a super sweet guy. He, he gave me a lot of starts on things that I probably didn't deserve it. But anyway, he was involved in a couple of other things. Wasn't going to be able to cover the Bruins. He had come up to uh, Boston to do something else, but, uh, said, Hey, I can't cover the Bruins. Are you interested? I was like, yes, yes, I am. And the funny thing is, is that that was during the summer of 86. And in my first failed assignment, I got scooped by my best friend back home because he called me up after I told him I got the Bruins gig. And he goes, hey, what do you think of Cam Neely? What do you know about him? I go, nothing. <laughs> and uh, because the trade had just happened, I think it was I looked it up. It was like June 21st on Neely's birthday. And so anyway, they traded him for uh, Peterson and what would eventually be uh, the pick for Glenn Wesley. So um, but anyway, it was uh, it was a lot of fun because um, I actually had a safety valve, too. If I ever ran into trouble with anybody in the front office or whatever, um, I was put in touch with uh, another sports legend. And that was Joe Fitzgerald, who um, wrote for the Boston Herald. and. Uh, I have to tell you, it was like, I was treated supremely well. I mean, everybody, you know, you just say, Hey, I'm with the hockey news. They'll say, Oh, all right, well, whatever you need. And, um, it was great because there was a lot of, a lot of free stuff and it had to be free because they didn't pay me anything. So, um, what I had to do in this, of course, is just as the internet is starting off, but it's not widely available. So my job was basically to get stories and interviews as they um, uh, as they come along. And Stan had stories he wanted to pursue. In fact, I'll never forget it. Um, uh, Salming for Toronto had just been suspended uh, for drug use. And so the question was, you know, ask a couple of prominent Bruins what they thought of the, the drug ban. And so I remember I went up to Ray Bork 
And, you know, I had asked him, you guys remember that old EF Hutton commercial when EF Hutton speaks, everyone listens. I had, I just finished asking the question about that. The room was silent. They wanted Ray's answer to it. And, uh, you know, he was very diplomatic about it, but John Blum at the time gave the greatest answer. He goes, I made $33,000 last year. There is no way I'm going to throw away this career for some blow. <laughs> <laughs> so, and he's not wrong. You know, in fact, it was funny because he's probably one of the rare uh, stay at home defensemen, which I love, by the way, just because you're a defenseman doesn't mean you have to score goals all the time. I mean, you do your job and you do it well, kind of like uh, uh, Carlo for the Bruins. You know, he's not going to score you a ton of goals, but he will shut you down. And I love those kind of uh, defensemen every day of the week. Um, now, it's funny because I had that, that um, job for two years. By, uh, by the second year, you know, just I couldn't make a living off of this. And it was funny because it was another roommate of mine that actually uh, made me realize that I didn't have a future in journalism, period. Um, one of my roommates used to work for the Lynn item. And I just remember one Saturday morning, he goes, Hey, I gotta, I gotta check in at the, the shop over in Lynn. You want to come up with me? I go, sure. Why not? We get there. And no sooner is he sitting at his desk, he gets a phone call from the editor telling him, Hey, I need a story by two o'clock. It's 10. And he goes, well, what do you need the story on? He goes, well, there's a golf tournament. Get me a story there. He goes, there's nothing on earth that's going to make that exciting. And in a matter of three phone calls, he got the groundskeeper and the owner to argue amongst themselves. And is like, I'm never doing that. <laughs> he knows what he's doing. And uh, yeah, ever since then. But I mean, I had a lot of fun while I had because the brewing games were all free, uh, except when. There were days when, after a poor performance, Harry Sinden would shut the doors. Nobody was getting into the locker room after he's had his moment with the team. Um, so those those were kind of interesting. Um, and, uh, you know, I met a lot of people, but uh, I think it mentioned that uh, the highlight for me was meeting the great one, Wayne Gretzky. Uh, and also Gordy Howe. I mean, they're, they're, they're neck and neck as far as I'm concerned. And what makes Wayne Gretzky such an amazing, not only athlete, but a human being, because when everybody was meeting and asking him questions, we were three reporting rows deep. I was in the back. There was no way I was going to be able to get a question in otherwise. So after everybody had disbanded, I ran up to him right away. Go, Wayne, can I just ask you three quick questions? He goes, well, where were you? I go, I was too far back. There was no way I was going to get to you. And he goes, all right, we'll make it quick and I'll answer your questions. And, you know, again, he didn't have to do any of that. He could have just said, F you. I don't even know who you are and walk out the door. But, you know, to the point that Andy made earlier, you know, hockey players are by far the best athletes to talk to hands down hands down so Chris what do you attribute that to I mean do you think it's just because it's it's such a team game and and do you think it's just because of the level of toughness that and to get to that level in the show um do you, do you think that that has a lot to do with it or do, or do you think it's just because they come like a lot of these players they come from you know when we were growing up a lot of these guys were coming from the farms in Canada versus coming from Europe do you think that that has a lot to do with it that because of that I think that's actually part of it. I, I think a big part is that what was so, when I first discovered, I think a lot of it is maturity. And what I mean by that is that you have kids going to host families as early as five and six years old, meaning they leave their own family so they can play in another part of Canada and they have a host family that puts them up, you know? And so, you know, in effect, they're, they're kind of becoming... Uh, not world travelers, but they're traveling an awful lot at such an early age. And, you know, a lot of us who have had the fortune to travel outside of our state or go anywhere realizes the value in that. And in some ways, there are a lot of, there are a lot of hard lessons that get learned that way. 
Um, and, you know, I think that that's part of it. Um, and of course, now we're starting to see some of the awful residual um, uh, problems with those kinds of sets up, setups. I think it actually started with Sheldon Kennedy um, 20 years ago and started to rear its ugly head. Yeah, uh, you know. there's been the Theo Fleury incident that he su- that he really suppressed his whole career, and uh, that's what he blames a lot of his codependency on. Um, mm-hmm. So yeah, the Sheldon Kennedy thing is terrible. They made a, a actual movie movie that was only released in Canada, uh, a studio movie about that, not a documentary. And the 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 way they capture um, the interaction between his character and the coach is so creepy. And if you've ever been a coach or been around kids and it really hits home and it's, it's definitely something that if you are a hockey fan and you have uh, a streaming service that has that, it's definitely worth watching that Sheldon Kennedy story movie. Um, That scene is, it sticks with me still to this day to talk about it because of just, uh, I've been in locker rooms. I've, played i've coached and it just it just hits so creepy the way that that whole and i'm sure that there's there's other instances that nobody knows about with other players that have swept stuff under the rug or suppressed it or whatever but um yeah that's uh, let's segue away from that and i'll i'm gonna ask you a question um have you ever had any interactions with bobby Orr when you were doing your uh no is the short answer you know and you'd think that he'd be a lot more uh, i wouldn't say close by but but then again i mean at that point he was starting in his career at that point with uh i think it was bob wolf associates the player agency and so i think uh, that was drawing him more away from the garden i mean the chief was always around because he was always uh um announcing the games for eei sports back then and, um, you know, there were a couple of um, Bruins that were around. Uh, of course, there's there's I'm not sure what to think of this one particular character, Josh. Uh, I'm not Josh. Um, Semple. Um, he was the man who attacked uh, the woman, the first woman marathon runner oh, in oh. Boston. And I can't remember his first name for the life of me right now, but. Uh, I was Jock Semple, I think it was. We were we were actually stuck sitting next to each other in the press box. Uh, wow. I guess that you know I'm not sure what his connection was to the Bruins, if any. But yeah, one of the things I will tell you though, he was great about telling uh, hockey stories because you know while it's nice to have the flair of a story, it's really disappointing when you look a little further and you realize that. All right, well, that's complete BS. Um, the one about Eddie Shore, that's that for the longest time was one of my favorite stories where he missed the Bruin bus. They were playing Montreal. And so anyway, um, as uh, he had to get in his car and drive up to Montreal in order to make it to the game, there was a snowstorm sweeping through Vermont at the time. And it got so bad that his windshield wipers started to freeze. So basically he stopped the car and smashed out the windshield. And so he got to the forum, but his hands were frozen to the steering wheel. So they had to wait a whole period just to thaw it out. And then ultimately he would win the game on his goal winning shot. And so anyway, it was like, that's a great story. But after looking into it, it's like, "Eh, that wasn't even remotely close to the truth. So anyway, (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I'm uh, going to go to my grave with that story. <laughs> so I, I'm going to have a, a yin and yang question for you. Who is yep. by far your favorite person that you've met? Oh, Wayne Gretzky. Hands down. Hands cool. down. Very cool. Um, and story about your least favorite person that you've met. <laughs> he wasn't a hockey player, believe it or not. It was this troll who wrote for the Salem Times. For some reason, he thought I was there to steal his job. But it's like, keep your crappy newspaper job. (laughs) (laughs) You know, this guy did such crappy things. And it's like, 
you know, if I were a legit threat, I could see that as, yeah, I get it. But I offered no threat to anybody in that room. You know, uh, he was a, he was, a, you know, the best part about it is that he was such a, a troll in that he was also afraid of the athletes in the room, because if they had to ask him questions, he would just, he wouldn't ask them. He, he would ask the other reporters to ask the question. It's like, you're a turd. You're a turd of a human wow. being. <laughs> so in your opinion, what's changed with uh, sports reporting from, let's say, the 80s till uh, now with the internet? I'm really glad you asked that question because one of the biggest challenges I faced even then was you had to be careful of the kinds of questions you asked. And I think that's actually what leads to the backsliding of journalism in general, because, you know, if a, a player has a tough game, you know, obviously you want to find out, you know, were you hurt? You know, what, what weren't you seeing out there tonight? You know, what, what changed your game? And, you know, there, um, the management is very, very uh, on top of that, you know, if, because they have, uh, they're not necessarily hall monitors, but if somebody is heard asking a question that maybe they shouldn't ask, they will pull you out and say, don't ask that question again, you know? And so you have to be very, very careful about those things because um, uh, that the drug use question, I had to run by uh, the PR person uh, before I asked it because they would require, you know, anything that's remotely controversial. Um, but it's really too bad because you can't get to that that depth anymore because I'm sure you've you know I'm sure you've read or heard at least uh, you know there's uh, the Bronx Zoo by Sparky Lyle uh, there's also Ball Four by Jim Bouton both of those are phenomenal books on on baseball but the very much seamy side of baseball and uh, there's a lot of truth to the things that go on in that you know you you can't ask the really tough questions. Um, one of my favorite lines though, from uh, uh, I think it was actually Bill Lee. He had thrown a terrible game. And so one of the reporters asked him what happened out there? He goes, what, you couldn't watch it either. <laughs> uh, Spaceman it, himself. Uh, you know, and one of my favorite Spaceman stories was the time he was called up from Springfield because he had asked a teammate, well, how do I get to Boston? They go, that's super easy. Jump on, you know, 90 and the pike will take you all the way in. He goes, you'll be there in two and a half hours. He goes, and he was right. Uh, you know, two and a half hours. I just entered Boston. I could see the park off to the right. He goes, but then for the next two and a half hours, I was circling the stadium. And I now know why they call Boston the hub, because you've got all these roads that lead nowhere. Yeah. And he goes, as I'm driving, I had this horrible thought that, wait a minute, maybe I had died, gotten into a car accident on the way, and now I'm in hell, and this is what I'm going to do for the rest of eternity. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, and for people that don't know the uh, the Boston setup, it is uh, it's quite, awful. <laughs> yeah, yeah, quite awful. It, it was built in a time that they weren't expecting the amount of people to live in the city that ended up, you know residing there let's just say yeah well i do want to go back and visit a question that can lead us off to something else afterwards because i had been really gung-ho i wanted to revisit a story that happened here in boston sports not too long ago and that of course was mitchell miller and you know it was one of those where i wanted to come from the side of you know he should probably get a second chance for something he did at the age of 15 because i know at the age of 15 i did a lot of horrible stuff you know however after doing more research on it uh i'm going to use a ten dollar word here um he's a recalcitrant douchebag <laughs> and wow. That's not even an SAT word, Bruce. I mean, come on. <laughs> Could you please use that in a sentence? Yeah. Spoken the like fact. a guy with a GED. <laughs> yeah, I mean, look, I got, man, I got two degrees and certification and something. Yeah, yeah, I have never used that word. I've never heard it ever. Well, you know, I think the fact that he was unapologetic for his actions tells me two things. 
he's dumb. He's really dumb because he could have just simply made even a half-hearted effort to make this work. And he could be playing in the NHL today as opposed to playing the KHL where he should just die there. That's fine. He should because uh, I was I didn't realize a lot of the things that I was hoping the Bruins could do with him. It looks like the Coyotes actually totally tried to do with him. And um, it was it's really unfortunate because it was it could have been a win win here for everybody, because the way it would have worked out is that, yeah, we'll sign you to the contract. But while you are here in Boston or NHL period, you're going to visit every single high school in the state. And you're going to speak out against bullying. That would have been the first part. The second part would have been the Bruins would be on the hook for paying the money to uh, the kid. Anything he has for disabilities, he needs a new wheelchair, they'll buy it. He needs tra transportation, they'll buy it, you know, because the amount of money that he would have run up doing that is still far less than the goodwill it would have bought for a lot of hockey in general, because it showed that the Bruins pivoted and did their best, you know. Instead, it turned into a cluster that I think that it's crazy. People, you know, calling for the firing of everybody involved. And it's just like, listen, a mistake was made, you know. And I think it's really weird because in some respects, um, we live in a weird time where mistakes are not tolerated. <laughs> it's just like, well, I'm kind of human, so you're going to have to work with me here. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, think, I think going in it would have been his best uh i don't know who his pr people are but they should have maybe they did but maybe he's just too too dumb and immature no matter what his age to to realize that there is an upside here and you know where people are uh meet and greet heavy right now with with different athletes and there is an avenue for that like you said about going to the hot uh different high schools he could have been you know, a goodwill ambassador kind of, and still played, and yeah. been out there uh, shaking hands and kissing babies, and or shaking babies and kissing hands, whatever, whatever it is, and you know, taking pictures with the kids and signing as much as he could till his, you know, hand was tired, and just kind of did it a different way. And I don't know the details about the Coyotes trying to, um, you know, kind of do something with him, but I, if you have any details about that. Well, I do know that they, they tried to get him on to that, that track of, we need you to speak out against bullying and we need you to do all. And he refused to. So it's, uh, it's, it's, it's inconceivable <laughs> how yeah. he could just pass up literally millions of dollars, you know? I mean, because, well, apparently the NFL has no problem paying $230 million to Sean Watson. Um, <laughs> and it was funny. I give the guys at the athletic total props on this because Jason Lloyd wrote an article about his concerns of Watson on July 29th. And two weeks later you have, Hey, words coming out that this is happening again, you know, and now it's a full on Cleveland messed up on a colossal scale here. I'm going to circle, Bruce, I'm going to circle back on the, on the Mitchell thing. First and foremost, I, I mean, I'm going to use an old NCAA term, lack of institutional control. <laughs> right. I mean, first, and, and, and that goes back to the school, Not, but first and foremost, like, Look, if your kid's that good of a hockey player, as a parent or parents, you have to kind of know what's going on. And, and like the thing about it is, it's like you know, like with the smoke, there's fire. And the thing about it is, like, look, we all did stuff when we were teenagers, especially when we were earlier. Like, we didn't think of the ramifications. You know, like now we're so into you know. And I don't mean this in a bad way. I just mean this is we're much more into like accommodating other people's feelings and how other people feel and that type of thing and that's, that's it's not wrong it's just we i mean think about this like you know the the three of us grew up in a very different age you know like our parents were raised by people that were went through the great depression in a world war and then they went through korea mm -hmm. they were pretty tough people 
And so they, and you know, I mean, you think about how many people, like you think about it. I mean, this is a stat going back probably 15, 20 years ago. There was at one point in time, there were a thousand World War II vets dying every day. So like you have that, that kind of like, and I mean, both my grandfather served in, in World War II. Uh, my dad, my dad's dad had six battle stars from the Pacific, um, you know, and there were certain things that, you know, growing up that my dad saw that he's like, I thought everybody's dad did that. And because of the horrors that were seen. Now, you know, and then, you know, so as we've kind of gone through things and everything like that, but, you know, like there's a certain thing about like you're spitting in somebody's face, you're pulling somebody on the bus and pounding on them. Like, look, I mean, there were times like the three of us can say that, hey, you know, growing up in elementary school, junior high school, when you're at the back of the bus, you're kind of at mercy of the bigger kids. But the thing about this is that, you know, to not like to walk away from millions and millions of dollars because you're you're just not like getting it because you're listening to the wrong people or the mm -hmm. people that you're listening to just don't get it. It's like, look, man, like you did something that was wrong. Jump in front of it. Admit it. Say, yeah, I screwed up. I made a huge mistake. I made this kid's life completely miserable for years. And you know something? Looking back at it, I'm sorry. And, and then it ties into your point of like, hey, you could actually go and talk to all the schools in the area and be like, look, I was an idiot. I was, I grew up and I was doing this and, and, you know, I just didn't realize like what I was doing and tormenting to somebody, you know, and, and to go to that point and then, you know, to kind of segue into the Deshaun Watson thing, you know, it's kind of funny. They knew, they knew this stuff about him when he was at Clemson because um, uh, Sweeney, he, he hasn't said anything about Deshaun at all. When all of this started to break, they knew it. And Bruce, you know this. All the guys that work in the NHL, all the guys that work in the NFL, all the guys that work in Major League Baseball as far as like team security at the higher level for the players, they're all former FBI. They're all former Secret mm -hmm. Service. They're yeah. all former state troopers. Like they know people that know stuff. And like, so like this wasn't a shock to the Texans. I mean, the Texans were, and then, like, and the thing about it was, is that it's funny how when Deshaun said something about the owner of the Texans, about kind of, you know, some racial things that went on in the 18, you know, from pretty much the start of this country and then got out uh, finished in 1865. And he said those things. And all of a sudden, a couple months later, all of a sudden, all these allegations come out, all these lawsuits come out and everything like that. Look, your millionaires can't fight with billionaires. You're mm -hmm. going to lose. And, and that's what happened. And then, but the, with this smoke, this fire. So the NFL, NFL, National Hockey League, Major League Baseball, look, they're commodities that the players know it. And the thing is, is that, like, they don't care if you're a good person. They care if you're a good, you know, baseball player, football player, hockey player. They, they, they don't care. It's like, who's going to put fan, people in fannies in the seats? And, and are you going to get me some, some good publicity so I can sell merch? And that's, that's where it comes from. Like Vince McMahon with Jimmy Snuka. <laughs> Excellent point, Andy. Case, case of money in a, in a New Jersey, uh, you know, police station. And uh, next thing you know, he's free and clear. That's all I'm saying. Yeah. <laughs> Allegedly. Well, <laughs> what, uh, going back very quickly about the, the institutional responsibility too, because we all remember the um, uh, Tyler Sagan fiasco and what saw him out of town. You know, I thought, well, that is the dumbest way to invest $5 million a year on a potential game changing player. Because if I were president of the Bruins, the first thing I would have done was, you know, whoever team captain is, I, I would have even paired him with Sean Thornton if I could, you know, it's just like, Sean, watch over this kid. Whatever he does, you're there. You're going to be you're going to be his voice. You're going to make sure he stays out of trouble because why wouldn't you protect that investment? You know, I mean, millions of dollars are literally at stake here and you chose to look the other way. That's on them. That yeah. is on them. I'm yeah. not going to blame a young 20 year old for being the way they are, because let's face it, uh, 
they're young adults and i want to stress young you know they haven't had lack life of experience, experience with life yes yes exactly you know and it's really unfortunate because the people who should know better need to step it up because right now the the nf segueing over to nfl what's so weird about this is that their priorities are so out of whack you know you can you can bust a, a quarterback for underflating footballs for four games yet a man who literally beats his wife got one game and it's like how do they equate? Because I need to understand the weird math that's going on here, you know? Um, so w- let me pause right there, Bruce. So yep. we, we've been at it for almost an hour. Mm-hmm. I'd, uh, I'd love to um, have you come on the show and cheer up with the guys, bring a very big skill set to the podcast. And, um, you know, I don't want to get too long winded with the interview or your time. And, uh, you know, I'll ask you if it's okay, if we can pause for now, maybe uh chapter two eventually, or <laughs> come on. I, I'd love to have you on the show. I think you'd be a, a great. Sure, Bruce. To us. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, one of the guys that we usually do the interviews with uh, Tom, he's always wanted to be a sports uh, writer, commentator. He's like the, our Gordon Soley, if you know who Gordon <laughs> Soley is, of our show. So, uh, yeah, we, we'd love to have you on. We record it usually on Saturday night. So uh, you have an open invitation to come on. We Like I said, we're in the, the football season right now. So if you're interested, you can get a hold of me and Ed, and, uh, you know, we'll, we can, you know, fit you in. 100%. 100%. This is – this is fun. And I've been watching your, your backlog of shows as well. So uh, So what do you think think of the show? I'm going to put you on the spot. Oh, there's, there's, there's nothing to put me on the spot. It's a good show. I think that right now it's, it's fun. It gets people involved and I like the gang approach actually, you know, (laughs) yeah, we, we're pretty eclectic. I mean, uh, (laughs) some some of the guys on the show have stories, but like I say all the time, I'd love to tell the stories and, and pop the channel as the kids say, but uh, I think we, we would get probably canceled really, really quick because uh, most of us have human resource departments that would yeah. be like, so um, do you like your job here? Uh, Ed, yeah, Ed, Ed, can, you. Thank you. Uh, Ed can confirm that the, uh, the stories have been changed to uh, protect uh, the innocent pretty much <laughs> on those shows. Um, yeah. So, so yeah, we 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 tiptoe around a lot of stuff. Like my Rolodex of comedy will get going, and I'll be like, oh, uh, it, I, yeah. So it's right up. <laughs> it is a thin line right there. So yeah, we usually well, do I mean, it in one, one take. And uh, you know, I'd love to have you come on and uh, meet the fellas. And uh, you know, big personalities sometimes on that show. So very very uh, fun. Glad uh, to call you a friend of the show, and hopefully we can. Uh, you know, get you on as a regular. Oh, I'd love it. In fact, you know, the timing is perfect because I've been looking for another project to get involved. And if this is it, I'm 100% on board. Oh, great. Um, the th- We're always looking for uh, avenues to uh, do bigger things and bring on, uh, you know, special guests to interview and, and get more involved with that and uh, draw more eyes to the channel. That's what, uh, you know, the uh, motivation is right now going into uh, next year will be year three. So, you know, we, we started right around the Super Bowl. So that'll be, you know, where we've been into it about two and a half years. So, yeah, love to have you on, not to get long winded. So thank you so much for uh, coming on. Ed, want to add to it? Well, uh, Bruce, thank you so much for coming on. I'd like to thank Sly Rock Music and also Cape Cod Tunnel Permits as well. You know, gotta get it, get the plug in there. You know, Sly Rocks Music. You know, that is that a dot com? Ed, come on. I, I, you know, I, is it? Could be. Oh, but but he he did make the point <laughs> to make sure I said Sly Rocks Music. I mean, I did talk to him this morning. So yeah, thanks, Bruce, Brett. <laughs> <laughs> Bruce, but thanks, thank thank you so much for coming on. We really appreciate your time. It is the hour has just flown by, and uh, we can't thank you enough. Ah, Ed and Andy, I'm totally looking forward to more wrestling talk. All right. So we'll see you when we see you, and hopefully it will be soon. 
Yes, absolutely. Okay. Thanks, Bruce. You guys take Bruce. care.